kind of a, a funny ongoing joke in the family that our dad is always on a parts run. So he loves, <laughs> loves going to the dealership. So I'm not sure we'll get him in the portal because he likes being there in person. But yeah. I think a very, a very great value add. Coming up, we're talking about dealerships. Excited to dig into the dealership model in agriculture, what's working, what's not with Bellcorp Ag's president, Peter Young. The Modern Acre podcast explores the latest in business, investing, technology, and sustainability in agriculture, and we're your hosts, Tyler and Tim Nuss. If you'd like to dig deeper with The Modern Acre, be sure to check out our membership community, The Modern Acre Co-op. The Modern Acre is presented by Local Line. Start 2024 off right with Local Line. Local Line is the all in one sales platform for farms and food hubs of all sizes. Increase your sales and streamline your processes with features including e commerce, inventory management, subscriptions, online payments, and more. Trusted by thousands of farmers in seven countries, Local Line is the platform you need to take your farm to the next level. Subscriptions start as low as $49 per month. Try Local Line today and receive a free premium feature for one year and receive 15% off Local Line's marketing services using our coupon code MODERNACRE. Ty, it's been a while since we've chatted sports. I think we just need to get into it. The Niners are the number one seed in the NFC. We have a first round bye heading into the playoffs. All is well in the world, Ty. We're just firing on all cylinders, get a bye week to rest up the squad. Looking forward to the playoffs. I'm excited. I'm cautiously optimistic. Um, Our hearts have been broken Mm. so many times over the past several years, Tim. So, well, you know, only one team can win the Super Bowl. Okay, so I'm just going to continue my Kirk Cousins mentality and perspective. And, you know, I hope it's their year, but if it's not, it's not the end of the world. I'm going to survive either way. It's just sports, but let's do this thing. Is this like new chill tie? Like what is what is happening right now? Where's the intensity? I'm putting the intensity in other areas of my life, Tim. You know this. Yes, I do know this. Yeah, speaking of intensity, you were you were so focused on the business, you just couldn't do anything extra. No hobbies for tie. You said no to fantasy football this year, and I ended up winning the league tie. So, <laughs> like what happened there? I don't know what that means. I don't know what to like take. What What's the takeaway here? Yeah, it's actually like the worst ROI ever of like you spend basically like 17 weeks of monitoring health statuses of players in the NFL every week tinkering with the lineup. Like I probably spend an hour or so a week of like focusing on fantasy football. And if I would have reinvested those hours, like, yeah, probably losing money, even if I do win the championship, but it feels good. You get the cred for the season. So I'm happy with the dub. Whatever, whatever works, however you want to justify it to yourself. But yeah, I agree. It's it's kind of like a lose lose scenario. Even if you win, you probably could have spent those those hours to better use. But you know, to each his own. I I, I don't know if I'm going back. I took a year off, Tim. I don't know if I'm going back. <laughs> we got to get you back in it. It's so fun. Little little dopamine hit every time one of your players gets a touchdown. You know what gives me a dopamine hit, Tim? It's tractor dealerships. Ooh, yes. So, guys, we're we're pumped about this conversation. Bellcorp Ag is a really, I would say, innovative Tim dealer um, within agriculture. They are really investing in acquiring more dealerships, investing in technology, and really being a partner with the growers, their their grower customers. And so, it was great to talk to Peter about his role, how they're thinking about growth and scale and their their owners and how they're thinking about continuing to invest and reinvest in the business. And I think a lot of lessons here about just this area of agriculture that we haven't talked about on the podcast of the dealership model, which is so crucial and critical to the ag ecosystem. Totally. Like not only are they providing like new equipment, but there's also a huge component, which is parts and service of keeping equipment that's in the field up and running. Like these are institution and institutions in local ag communities. Like you and me went to this dealership when we were little kids with dad and looked at the tractors and our grandpa took dad to the, to the same dealership when he was a kid. So it's been around in the area for a super long time. And it's cool to see how 
company like Bellcorp kind of like takes the existing business and adds technology to it. Like one thing that, in, that new that they introduced was online parts ordering where dad and Derek are always going to the dealership to get parts. And now they have an online system to do that more efficiently. Actually did that for the first time last week, did our first parts order. So it's just cool to see how they're innovating and we get into that on the podcast. It's just overall a, an awesome conversation. Let's jump in with what's top of mind for Peter. You know, it's the uh, the whole John Deere tech stack that uh, Belcorp, you know, we're a dealer, so we're supporting that tech stack as they invest and roll out new platforms. Uh, but it's coming to us like a fire hose uh, in the last three to five years. Every every quarter, John Deere has got a new product launched. Um, you know, 2023, we saw them acquire Smart Apply, which is an orchard vineyard sprayer. So bringing that into our portfolio the requirements on setup, training, support, um, you know, that's just one little product that we're seeing um, over over the whole spectrum. And, and a dealer like us in California, we have everything here. You, know, you can grow anything that you guys know, you can grow anything here you want. So the John Deere tech stack applies to, you know, it basically applies to everything that we have. Um, they're focused on corn and soybean, really nailing that down. But the offshoot of that, uh, you know, the other the other packages that they have are very very relevant to uh, our AOR. So trying to trying to stay up, sorry, trying to stay up with John Deere uh, and uh, and keep our uh, our customers in the know and uh, uh, and introducing the products to them. That's what's top of mind for me for sure. No, this is super interesting. We we haven't talked to a, a dealer on the podcast before, which is really a shame because the dealer network is so critical to how ag functions. And you guys are really serving the local community, the local growers, and with things like yeah, service, parts, maintenance, and you just said it. You're having to really understand where the tech is going and what, you know, how John Deere is thinking about it, how it can be used in the, in the field and how it can really provide value to growers. And you're really having to be the boots on the ground to communicate, hey, this is why you should do this. This is why this will help you on the field. So you serve just, I think, a critical role in the ag ecosystem. But uh, yeah, I can imagine that you're, you're trying to almost play, play this role of mediator between, hey, this is, this is how we interpret the tech and how you can use it so that the grower is like, oh no, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in this. Yeah, and we've seen, you know, I think John Deere's learning too about uh, how to roll a product out. And they do a good job of bringing uh, the products out slowly. They do launches, they do test pilots, beta, um, we've definitely been involved a lot in the high value prop space on getting the, in front of uh, the, the customers early on, getting their feedback, you know, making the changes before it's fully launched. But, um, you know, this is new stuff uh, and it's new for our dealer, you know, our, the dealership model. How do you support it? You know, is there a revenue stream that supports it? And uh, what do the customers expect on support? Uh, you know, this, I don't know if you guys have seen this Smart Apply product that's been launched last year, but the, it's really, really a nice product line uh, that, uh, you know, gets retrofitted onto a, an orchard sprayer or a vineyard uh, sprayer, and it works, you know. But, you know, it's taken us three years to kind of figure it out. Uh, we were one of the first Valley dealers to have a product. Um, it was launched up in, uh, in Sutter Home uh, Vineyards, and it's been, you know, now we have about 12 units running around the Valley, and uh, the product's great. Once you, once you get to get one, I think growers want more. But it's taken, it takes time and, you know, we've stumbled a few times how to sell it, how to support it. And, uh, but, you know, that's the, that's the dealership model. You know, we're not breaking any uh, atoms here. You know, we are, we are about support, figuring out how to, how to, how to, uh, how, to how it works. And, and we just get, try to get better incrementally every day. Pete, would love to learn a little bit more about you. What's, what's your background and how did you find yourself uh, working at a John Deere dealer? Yeah, it's a good, it's a, this is kind of the story I'm you know, I'm not native of California. You probably can hear my accent uh, over time here, and I apologize for that. Uh, I'm uh, I'm Canadian. I'm from uh, Winnipeg, Manitoba, north of North Dakota. For anybody who doesn't know where Winnipeg is, um, I grew up there. Uh, I am a CPA by training. Uh, I spent uh, a bunch of years in Winnipeg. I got my CPA. Worked for KPMG, and then uh, transferred to the West Coast, uh, Vancouver, Canada. Uh, I worked with KPMG there for five years. I uh, got a chance to see a lot of different businesses. What's the nice thing about a CPA program? You can see a lot of different uh, 
different businesses by which I like. I like operations. I didn't. Uh, I was not. Uh, I was not a very good accountant. <laughs> so I'm like I knew my my life wasn't going to be in the public accounting realm. Um, and then I got on with uh, Univar, which is the world's largest chemical distributor, um, and uh, I worked for the Canadian subsidiary there, it's out of uh, Richmond, British Columbia. Um, and then um, with that, I, I worked for Cummins. I don't know if you're sure if you guys know uh, Cummins Power, but I uh, had a great experience with Cummins, worked with them for 10 years. Uh, I started off as an accountant and ended up running, I was the operations manager for 20 of their stores in Western Canada. So really liked the operation side of the distributor model. Um, and uh, that's what brought me down through John Deere. I was uh, looking for work after uh, Cummins consolidated their, uh, their distribution arm and uh, looking for another role in this distributor space. Um, and uh, our owners out of Canada, Bellcorp's owner uh, is a family owned business and they, uh, they were looking for an operations person down here. So I've been down in California for 10 years. I tell you, I did not know Central Valley Ag. Uh, I didn't know anything about it. I just came down and uh, I liked John Deere. I liked the brand, I liked the reputation. And our, our owners, you know, our owners in it for the long term. I mean, they're, they're an 80 year business. They've been uh, multi-generations. They're buy and hold and optimize. And uh, so I really liked what they had to say. And I really liked uh, getting down here and learning about California Ag. It's been uh, Every single day I learn something new. Um, this is an incredible place. It's got so much diversity, uh, great customer base, um, and just a, it's been a, just been a fun, fun 10 years. What a cool story and awesome how you landed in California agriculture. And to your point, you get exposed to a lot in California with 400 different types of crops grown. So a little bit more complex of things going on versus a dealer that's in the Midwest that's only focused on row crop and corn and beans. You get to get exposed to a lot. But before we jump into the business itself, maybe let's level set a little bit. Talk about the size of Belcorp Ag. How many locations in the, the state do you have? Yeah, we have a, we, I call it four full time, full four service stores. So, you know, part service sales. And then we have three smaller stores that focus on part support and some service offerings out of those. Uh, we just bought a new one in Santa Clara. So that's exciting. We just added that to our network. Um, our sales are in the range of 150 to $200 million. We have uh, around 200 employees, uh, 75 techs. 40 parts people and men and salespeople. So uh, we got a great little business here. We are very diverse. Uh, we have the entire John Deere platform uh, other than uh, uh, loose engines. We sell everything. We sell the golf line. We have the small construction line. We have the ag line, um, the turf line, uh, which is great for us. And I always tell people it's, you know, when one, when one segment's up, the other's down and it's a nice little business. It's uh, it's, it's so very fortunate to have uh, the entire John Deere. We, we don't do the large construction part of it, but uh, we do basically everything else. So we saw our largest piece of equipment would be our chopper, uh, our corn self-propelled forage harvester. Um, and then we sell down to the, uh, well, we used to sell lawnmowers before the uh, emissions changed and you can't sell lawnmowers anymore, but uh, now, we're, uh, now, we're, now we're selling electric lawnmowers. So, Peter, talk to us a little bit about just the the strategy here. The owners are looking to, you know, you said based in Canada, looking to grow out this dealer network under the Bellcorp uh, really umbrella. You just made a purchase in Santa Clara. Is this? Are, are you guys looking to continue to expand and acquire more dealers? How are you thinking about growth from like an acquisition perspective? Yeah. So our, our, our parent company strategy, which is, you know, again, it's a, it's a, it's a business that um, has always just looked for really solid businesses and uh, invest for the long term. We, we buy and hold. Uh, we've had the same businesses in our, in our portfolio for 50 plus years. John Deere is a new one. You know, we bought, we first got introduced to this opportunity 10 years ago. For me, it's the, I call it the, the first five years was uh, introductory. You know, we, we spent some time buying some smaller dealers and putting it together into a larger group. And then the last five years have been uh, really optimizing and getting better. Um, so uh, we spent a lot of time in the last five years really trying to improve our customer support model. Our business now is kind of prime for growth. Uh, we are looking to uh, continue to grow our footprint. Um, and there's no surprise. I mean, it's not going to, this is a, Real, this is like breaking news. You know, bigger usually means better for us. We have a bigger footprint, so we can have more, more technicians, 
more service trucks, more parts on the ground for customers, more inventory for new sales. It really uh, improves our, our ability to support customers as we grow our footprint out. So, I mean, long term, our strategy definitely we'd like to see an ability to grow. Uh, that depends on whether or not we're successful. You know, we we don't you can't just go buy John Deere dealerships without getting um, doing well for John Deere and doing well for the customer. So we have to prove our model every year, and and uh, that's what we're trying to do. Peter would love to dig into ag tech a little bit. We talk a lot about ag tech on the podcast and a couple of companies like Gus is pretty well known in the space. They have a relationship with John Deere. Maybe talk to us about like how you look at these companies and what the conversation is like with Deere when you're looking at ag tech places in the marketplace to see if they're a fit for your growers. I always talk about ag tech when I think about um, the product is some of the ag tech that we see is really easy fit. Um, you know, customers, as soon as they touch it, they're like, oh, yeah, that's a slam dunk for us. So uh, the new launches, like like you said, like Gus, Gus has uh, was started down south and has done a, has done a very good job uh, of uh, really harnessing the large grower um, down south, uh, large permanent crop um, players down there, a lot of, a lot of permanent crop sprayers. Um, we, uh, we have not seen the Gus enter our region yet. Uh, there is some floating around, some of them. Some of the uh, uh, large growers that do have uh, acreage in our area, but you know our our job um, to get John Deere, uh, if John Deere is uh, a partner with the product, you know we we are then a, become a partner of the product. So um, it's kind of that's the way that it works on the terms of dealership. John Deere bought Smart Apply. We are now a Smart Apply supporter and dealer. Uh, we were actually we were a supporter of that product before it showed up, uh, before John Deere purchased it. Um, and, uh, but then that's, you know, what we're really seeing John Deere do is they, they are really getting, in, improving their infrastructure. So John Deere Operations Center, that, that tool, uh, which is, you know, the one-stop shop for tech uh, uh, platform for a farm, uh, that thing, they, they've really put a lot of money and support into that. Uh, and that becomes, you know, our, our go-to platform, our, our consolidator for our customers on their maintenance cycles, on tracking their products, on bringing their uh, harvest data into uh, into an online platform. Um, so I'd say that kind of, you know, there's acquisitions they do, and then I'd say the ultimate, you know, their tech stack as they build it out and introduce it, we become um, the, the, uh, the communicator or the translator to the grower, how it can fit into their operations. Peter, talk to us a little bit about just the business. I mean, you've you've been growing the business over the past several years. Like, what has worked? What has not worked? What what are, what are some of the challenges about about growing a dealership? You know, I think the first thing I'd say, like I, I break down our history into like a two segments. The, you know, the first five and the last five. I think the first five we spent a lot of time looking internally how we could. I would say that that was probably wrong. I think you got to start with the customer. What do the customers want? How do they want um, service and support? Um, and so we've been doing that. I think that's been a real learning for our organization is just focus on what the customer needs and wants, listen to them, and uh, and get really, really good at customer support. That's what I've been trying to do for the last little while is really kind of look, look at our processes through the customer's lens and improve on that. And you'll see that. I mean, I, and, and you'll see that on our, how we support our customers on service how we communicate with people on service repair events, how we make sure that we have the right part in stock when they call in. Do we answer the phone every single time? Uh, just simple things like that, you know, and it, it seems like, oh, that's a no brainer, but to get 45 or to 50 parts people answering phones at a 97% answer rate, it takes time and process and, and making sure that we have the right training for those people, you know, using algorithms to make sure that we have the right parts in stock, uh, to uh, foresee demand, embedding that into our parts culture to have the part on stock in the shelf ready to go when the customer calls in. And, you know, when they drive in to pick up the part, we better have that part ready for them and sitting on a shelf and they know we know who they are and we just put it in their truck and they off they go. So that's what I think that the biggest thing I've learned in the last, you know, 10 years I've been down here is focus on the customer. Peter, farming in California can can be up and down where it's cyclical and very seasonal and your your business is obviously very well tied to to farmers. Like how do you manage that as a business leader when there's there's up years, down years, and in a down year, maybe growers are less less inclined to, to buy a new tractor or buy new equipment? Like how do you forecast that as a business and communicate that to John Deere when there's so much up and down nature of the business? 
Well, it's a couple of things. We, we are very fortunate to have a very uh, broad customer base. So, you know, when almond prices are down, grapes are up, or small construction markets going crazy, or the golf market has suddenly reemerged, or you know, on the consumer market during COVID, we could not keep uh, small tractors on the shelf. People were just flying off. I didn't foresee that. And yeah, so, what I'd say is I, st- I kind of stopped forecasting <laughs> and then uh, don't go too long on any product. Um, and uh, and then if things slow down on the sales side, on the product pool set, we have this wonderful aftermarket. You know, we have this, we have tractors that are driving around and they need to be serviced and support. Uh, they, need to, they need to sell parts to them and, and then focus in on that. So get, I'm, I've, I've told my team, uh, I continue to, my mantra is don't worry about, uh, don't worry about what the future holds. Just focus in on what's in front of you. Uh, we are, we are a, we are a dealer. Um, and uh, we really can't get into the forecasting model too too in depth. Uh, we're about executing what's in front of us every single day and making sure a customer has a wonderful experience when they when they touch Belcourt back. Yeah, I can imagine that's like a a tough dance is how much inventory to have on hand. You always want to have the product that the customer needs at the right time, but you also don't want to just have over over supply of inventory. Yeah, I mean, it, it's a very tough dance um, and you never get it right. So, you know, just be, we're, just, we're trying to be reasonable. We try to set up, set up targets, set up goals, what we're trying to accomplish. Um, our order bank, um, so our order timelines have gone after COVID really expanded. You know, they were talking about 12 to 18 month long wait times for product, for, tra- for, for some uh, tractor models. And, you know, you just have to communicate that with your customers, get them on order. Um, they understand. Uh, it's amazing. The ag customers are so understanding around. They, they, you know, they they live in the supply chain world on a day to day basis. So they understand. You know, we're not the only ones having supply chain problems, um, and so they're very understanding and accommodating. And we try to make sure we can keep them up and running. We have backup units, and while they're waiting for their new tractor, making sure they are productive and and they are uh, we're supporting them. What's the most important decision that you've made in the last year or so? We double down on uh, parts uh, and how we uh, we think about um, our infrastructure for parts. So we've invested a bunch of money um, in the last 12 months on increasing our capacity and being much more efficient uh, with uh, how we uh, store our parts. We've invested a bunch in vertical lift modules in our Stockton location. Uh, so that we can condense our parts uh, profile uh, and open up capacity. Um, and it's really, we've cleaned out our organization so that our parts people, we, we either answer phones or we fulfill. And we've split our business that way in our parts side of things. So we've invested in a text platform and we've invested in, uh, in a much stronger uh, inventory, parts inventory footprint. Because we think that's a differentiator uh, going forward. And it, I mean, it has probably been a differentiator for years, but uh, we felt that there was a little bit of a, we had a weakness there that we uh, were really didn't be able to overcome in the last 12 months. I'm really proud of the team uh, and what we've done. Uh, our fill rates have uh, gone up 20% in the last six to nine months. And it's, uh, I'm really, I'm really happy with the portfolio that we've put together to support customers. Yeah, it's been cool to see you build that out. When we were when we met a couple of weeks ago at the at the end of season lunch, you talked about the online portal and have s- since signed up for that. So really cool to see you offering these tools where yeah. growers don't have to to make a phone call every time. If they're tech savvy, they can look up parts and order online and facilitate it there. So I'm sure that streamlines your side of the operation too. But yeah, kind of a, a funny ongoing joke in the family that our dad is always on a parts run. So he loves yeah. loves going to the dealership. So I'm not sure we'll get him in the portal because he likes being there in person. But yeah. I think a very, a very great value add. Yeah, it's funny. It's it's gen, it's a real generational thing we see in in our in our customer base. I'm not going to put you know I'm not going to age discriminate to, anyways. But there's a the new age uh, uh, person ordering parts. It's incredible to see how tech savvy they are and how they, much they want to use the portal um, to order parts. They know the part they want. They know they want to clean up. They want to make sure they have their, all their tractors and all their serial numbers in their portal, all ready to go. They can look up the part order it, they get a best price possible, they can find out where things are at. That's been a real win for, uh, um, and then we, we are happy to take up the phone and we're happy to do that on, in person too. You know, we want to be nimble for all our customers, but we're seeing more and more of that volume go 
to uh, online. So it's fun. Yeah, it's cool to see you innovate within such a legacy business like a, a dealership, like our da- data stories of going to the the John Deere dealership in Stockton with his grandpa, like with our, our grandpa. And just it's like such a fixture of the community and like to see multi-generations like use that same facility and have it like adopt technology over time and iterate is really cool. And you're helping kind of facilitate that. Well, it's good. I, you know, it's interesting. I When you say that, I, that was our biggest challenge last year. We looked and we set ourselves about before we made our big investment in parts, we said, what our problem is, is we're trying to treat every customer exactly the same. We're trying to like answer the phone. We're trying to, uh, in our capacity, we just couldn't keep up. So we really thought through around, let's put people through the portal. The people that want to go on the portal, let's put them into the portal. And ha- we don't have to talk to them on the phone. And those people that really want to talk and come to the, come to the dealership, they're going to, they're going to, they're going to get world-class support. They're going to answer the phone or they're going to be someone there to help them when they come to the dealership. So that's when really how we took a lot of customers out of the, the phone and put them into the portal, which opened up capacity for us. So I'm really, I'm really happy with the result of that. Peter, what's your ag hot take? My ag, I, I saw that question. My ag hot take is ag is not a lot, it's not a lot different than the other industries I've been in. And, and this is my hot take. The ag is customers, they want great service, they want great support, and they want a fair price, you know, and it's not that different. Uh, I, I, I came from the oil and gas mining and on highway truck market. I'd say the customers are very, very similar. The only thing that's a little different uh, would be the generational uh, component to, uh, to the um, ag industry. Um, and you've got to be very careful not to burn bridges with one generation because you're not going to ever see that customer back. <laughs> Um, it's a, you, to build that reputation back after you burn a bridge. It's, it's a, it's like three generations later, they're still talking about the time that you screwed up a repair on their tractor. And so we got to be careful on the, the memories in our industry. But again, servicing, serving, servicing an oil and gas customer, an oil rig and a uh, pit tractor, not much different. Um, it's just, they, you know, there's a lot of urgency in season. Um, there's a lot of support needed. It's, it's 24-7, 365. You've got to have the capacity and the culture built to support those people um, during the peak times. Um, you know, there's downtimes, and then you should take advantage of the downtimes to support them. Do your preventative maintenance in the, in the shoulder seasons um, and, try to, uh, and try to support people. Um, but peak times are peak times, and it's, and it's a really, really busy to make sure your customers aren't being disappointed in that peak time. Peter, what's the most valuable lesson you've learned over your career? Well, I tell my team always, uh, do what you say you're going to do. Um, that's my, uh, that's, you know, in, in it kind of ties back to your reputation. You know, when I say I'm going to do something, we do it. Uh, and that's what kind of my, my mantra that I've, I've uh, run with for many years. And, you know, there's sometimes you make mistakes and, uh, and I, and I will be the first one to say, I make mistakes and I learn about them and I talk to people about the mistakes. Don't be, don't shy away from your mistakes. Talk about them, document them, and then figure out how to, how to avoid them in the future. That's my, that's not that, you know, it's not that complicated of a, of a theory, but that's what I, I live by. You're on the ground, you know, talking with growers, supporting growers, you're involved with the latest and greatest with John Deere. I mean, what, where do you see ag headed in the next five to 10 years? Like, do you have any predictions about, you know, whether it's consolidation or technology, like where, where do you see the industry going? Well, on the, on the dealer side, um, I'd see the dealership role becoming more important. We are being, we, you know, we're the shock absorber and we are always going to be the shock absorber between the OEM and the customer and just making sure that, because OEMs are good at being and aren't good at being a dealer, and I'm not good at being an OEM. So that's I believe that's going to be like this for many many years. In terms of the tech uh, or the where the future goes, I think it's going to be more complicated. In the last three years, we've had to hire a bunch of of really bright, smart, capable people to handle the incoming tech into our stores and into our uh, into our our process. Uh, I think that's going to expand, uh, which is going to increase our cost. Um, and we're going to have to figure out how to recover from that. That's going to be the challenge for me for the next three to five years is we have to up, we have to ramp up our investment before there's any kind of trailing revenues associated with it. Um, so I think about that pretty regularly, just how do we handle that 
uh, upfront investment in technical capability. Um, these aren't cheap people you're hiring. You know, these are not 20 bucks an hour people. These are $100,000 an hour uh, a year, $150,000 a year uh, type of role. And you know, for a dealership that runs on thin margins, those are difficult people to bring on without some kind of a plan. So I think about that um, as, a, as, a, as an issue for us. Peter, fun one as we wrap up. What's saving your life right now? I thought about that. Um, so I, I joined Orange, Orange Theory in September. I don't know if you guys know Orange Theory, but it's been awesome. Uh, I kind of was kind of a little bit lazy in the summer, uh, and so that's really kicked me in the butt. I play a lot of basketball, so Orange Theory has helped me kind of uh, round out my cardio uh, and my strength. So, you know, I combine the Orange Theory and my old man basketball. I seem to be going into 2024 in a good physical uh, health uh, space. So that's keeping me with a lot of energy. And I'm pretty, I'm just really happy to my sisters. My sisters, you guys are brothers. I got my sisters kicked me in the butt to join the Orange Theory. It's been really nice to have that in my life for the last couple of months. That's awesome. Good sisters. Good sisters. Yeah, no kidding. They're better than you. <laughs> Peter, how can listeners get in touch and connect with you and Belcor Bag? Well, I'm a text guy, so happy to you know, feel, feel free to text me at 209-232-0802. I'm on WhatsApp. I'm on LinkedIn. And then you can uh, you can check out our chat feature on our website. Um, I should be able to – I should get knocked. You can do a test and check me. I should be able to get – somebody should be you know, let me know in about five minutes if you've ever uh, texted us through our website. So, Ty, what do you think? dealerships, Tim, you know, two years ago, three years ago, I would just want to be talking to the sexiest, trendiest ag tech company. But now I'm into dealerships. And I think Bellcorp is super on it. I think they they know what works in their business, what doesn't, and how to serve customers and being a, you know, John Deere dealer, what does that look like and how to be ahead of things and invest where, hey, it costs money to have engineers on staff and to acquire acquire more locations, right? But they're doing it to grow it into a bigger business. And I just am super impressed with that. And yeah, I was my wheels were turning, Tim, about the dealership model and how that fa- fits into ag tech and what that means for the industry. And so it, it was cool to talk with Peter. Totally. Yeah. It seems like it's all about relationships and serving their customers and customer service, whether that means in a digital frontier or in person as, as customers deal with them. So it's cool to see them just really double down on, on service because I think that's so huge in ag. Guys, if you want to dig deeper, nerd out on businesses, um, some like-minded people that love agriculture, love business, you got to join the Modern Acre Co-op. It's our membership community. It's with builders in food and ag. We have bi-monthly member calls. We have exclusive audio content from Tim and I and discounts on merch. So much stuff that you get by being a member of the co-op. You can sign up just for one month. There's monthly, there's annual, or you can be a lifetime member, a super fan, as Tim puts it. So be sure to check out the Modern Acre Co-op. Join us digging into to ag at a, at a deeper level. <laughs>